They followed the leader into the mountains, sat at his feet in a Swiss canton as they decayed like rotting fish. And he looked at them and said, turn off the ventriloquist voice. Flush out the snake oil in the blood. Your Bible, your Gita, your gems, your guns, your flags, your death. And at night, they went to the nightclubs gobbling and soaking up the suds, while that thing between the legs became more urgent. They dished up the cold turkey of what he had said, and nobody felt too good. Nobody felt. So they took the train, the limousine, the rucksack, and went back home. Next year, they followed him to India, and again he looked at them and said, follow no leader, guru. Nobody is living, everybody is dead. And again, he told them, told them. And again, that thing between the legs and between the ears got in the way. But by God, with the help of enough drink and drugs and books like this in my handbag, I will find out. On rereading this eclectic antinomic today, Burroughs' critical onslaught is to a breathtaking, relentless shock and awe, assault, straight, uptight, Republican sensibility, every page fueling the drive towards subversion. We are part of a chapter of Harold Norse's cut up novel, Beat Hotel, and it is the postscript. 1963, and it is called The Death of the Rue Gillecourt. Sitting in Paris, Gillecourt, at my table writing, a bat flies in through the window at three in the afternoon, slides under the table and disappears. A postcard from Chinatown, SF, San Francisco, simultaneously drops from the ceiling out of nowhere. Everything is normal, nothing is strange. Back Black bat flits in slow motion to the table's bottom where it vanishes. Everything is possible. Dream description of the Beat Hotel on the street where lies the heart. An Indo-Chinese lady in silk pants parts bamboo curtains and slips downstairs. A giant black from French Guiana. Dream machine spins round and round, opening hash visions and colors as it crashes sight barrier and changes cells of the brain. A great American writer receives whole episodes in his sleep for the novel of the century. Prophetic utterances, agonized Christs, poems, quotations, huge genitals on cracked walls. A poem like bomb goes off. Then it is over. A dream finished. The hotel has changed hands. Workmen hammer and plaster. Halls full of tools and bags of cement. Old spiral staircase, white with dust. No more all-night jam sessions on the ceilings about to fall. Cats on the floor and sleeping bags, eight or nine to a pad. No more guitars and horns. Silence. The old cafe is the made for travel. Beer and wine bottles off the shelves. Ghostly espresso machine. No more watery coffee. The chairs gate. Nobody there now where we used to gather and talk. Only the new proprietor, a dumb prick businessman, and a hard-faced bitch who already confide that they don't dig sloppy, weedy foreigners with hash brown beards, chicks in blue jeans, and army surplus markets. They gotta go, she said. The cafe will be a reception room with somebody, probably her, haunting a desk around the clock. Surveillance. Respectability. Ancient hotel destroyed. We made a film actually in all the rooms and visited William Burroughs' room, Gregor Foster's room, Alex's room, Brian's room, Harold Norse's room, etc. etc. for about two hours. Made the movie. And then I asked this lady, what are you going to do with all the stuff in it? I said, well, we're going to throw it away. So I said, Madam, could I please have Gregory Corso's door? <laughs> you know, the famous Ginsburg photo with Gregory uh, with a bunch of grapes looking out the window and the door? That door. So that's 
I guess that's all that's left of the old Beat Hotel. With everything we have, enormous amount in our parks, mines, and now we have this uh, souvenir. Give it, give it, give it. Thank you.